There we go. Okay, so that's me and my business partner, Scott. And um, so Scott and I went to high school together, and at our reunion, we reconnected and then decided to go into business together. And Scott is kind of your stereotypical software developer. I mean, look at him. He's white. He's male. He wears dark rim glasses. He has a beard, and he's wearing a geeky t-shirt that says, come to the dark side, we have cookies. <laughs> so when he came to the reunion and said that I'm a software developer, no one was surprised, right? He was the guy in high school who uh, helped out at the library and helped at the computer lab. He was president of the computer club. Like, it was just not a surprise that Scott became a software developer. I am not your typical software developer. In fact, when I joined the company eight years ago, I learned how to code. And for seven of those eight years, most client meetings ended like this. I would go and I would explain what Corgi Bytes does and I would explain things like cyclomatic complexity and test-driven development. And the client would usually look at me like they were, like they were looking at a zoo animal and trying to figure out its origin. Um, and usually their curiosity would get piqued and they would say, so, I'm sorry, I, I have a question. Do you code? And I got asked this question over and over and over and over again for like seven, eight years. And I tell you, if you want to get stunted in feeling like you're not good at software, um, that's a great way to do it. So I, I find no one ever, ever asked Scott this question, ever. And so finally I said, you know what? I'm going to get a tattoo. Um, so I, I got a tattoo mostly so that I could look at it myself and say, you know what? I can be anything I want. My parameters are undefined, <laughs> and uh, you know, also it had the benefit of it's on my right hand, so when I extend my arm to say hi to someone, you know, they kind of infer that I know how to code. So I haven't gotten asked this question in the last year, and my confidence has really taken off. So if I'm not your stereotypical marketer, like, or stereotypical developer, why did this happen? Like, why did Scott, when you see Scott, you look at him and you say, oh yeah, he's your stereotypical developer, but you look at me and you say, hmm, I don't know why people ask me to code. Well, it has to do with toys and movies. So, I grew up in the 80s, and there's a lot of awesome stuff in the 80s, including a number of um, different movies where the trope is that the boys get to create technology and the girls at best are innocent bystanders who are cheering the boys on. So things in like The Wizard and The Last Starfighter and War Games. And at worst they're objectified. So Revenge of the Nerds and Weird Science, like women are there, you know, as, as objects and not actually participating in anything. The other thing is that the Commodore 64 came out. And if you ask most of the developers who kind of grew up in mid, early, late 80s, um, they'll say that this is how they learned how to code and that their first program that they learned how to write in was basic. And that's because of the Commodore 64. It was awesome, but here was the thing. It was marketed as a toy for boys to the point where like there, there's a great art, um, uh, article sound interview on Planet Money um, where they talk about this and there are many women who remember like wanting to play with these but it was in their brother's room and they weren't allowed to play with it. So I should have wanted to become a software developer because I had access to technology growing up. My parents in 1986, I was five, and my dad quit his corporate job and he bought a Macintosh computer and said, I'm gonna do graphic design. Like really like forward thinking stuff. And he ran a business out of our house until I was 14. I had access to the internet in 1995 and I had a T1 in 1997. So, I mean, I had access to all of this stuff, but here was the problem. Because of the culture that I grew up in, I felt like I was allowed to use technology and I never felt like I was allowed to create technology. We did not have um, Hello Ruby or Gold, Gold Blocks or Girls Who Code when I was growing up. We had Teen Talk Barbie.
So this was, the, this was the toy that I got to play with over and over and over again. So, so while the boys of, of my generation got to play with the Commodore 64 and they were told, like, go create all of this cool stuff, I was told with the toys that I was playing with, math class is hard, shopping is fun, your job is to be supportive, and that boys will never like you if you're too smart. So I became your stereotypical marketer. <laughs> And um, so at the reunion, there's Scott and me, and um, I was in sales, and I'm kind of a social butterfly, which I think is just an artifact of kind of social anxiety. And um, Scott came up to me and said, I built, a I built a product 18 months ago. I solved a really interesting technology problem, but it turns out nobody wants to buy it. And I've done a bunch of research on the internet, and it says that I have a marketing problem, and you've been doing marketing and you have a blog about marketing and I think that I'd like to hire you as, and you can come on board. So he gave me 51% of his company if I would come on and be his boss. And we said, this is gonna work great. Like, you'll be Waz, I'll be Jobs, we've got this thing. Like, and I said, but you know, I, I need to probably learn how to build software if I'm gonna run a software company, right? And I was like, that's not gonna be too hard. Um, but I was a little wrong. <laughs> I got just a little overwhelmed, and I had that Barbie voice in my head over and over and over and over and over again, saying, coding is hard, you shouldn't be here, you should quit, go home, you're a marketer, people are gonna see it. But you wouldn't let me quit. I met so many people in the software community that said, coding is a skill. No one is born out of the womb knowing how to code. As, as much as we like to think of the mythical programmer, that doesn't happen, right? It's a skill, you have to apply yourself, and it's hard for everyone. You can learn this, you are smart, we believe in you. And that was what kept me going. So one of the people that I met early on um, at my very, very first software conference um, was Jeff Casimir, who now runs the Turing School in Colorado. And he gave a talk about how to become a polyglot programmer. So a programmer who codes in multiple languages. And, you know, this was six, seven years ago. I was maybe about a year, 18 months into my software development career. So I was just, I, I, was, I had just enough knowledge to be a real pain in the ass and, and have enough arrogance to get on stage and give a lightning talk. And so I gave a lightning talk about um, adding another language to your tech stack, English. <laughs> because as somebody who used so much software, I was so frustrated with things like error messages and <laughs> like documentation and all of the English artifacts that go along with creating good software. And the more that I've looked into this over the past, you know, six, seven years, um, it turns out that I wasn't wrong. So there's an obscure little law in computer science that says that you can predict the messiness of your code base by looking at the communication systems within your organization. And it's called Conway's Law. And this is why we end up with legacy projects. It's not because of the technology. It's not because it's written in COBOL or Fortran or insert your language here. It's because the communication around those projects is so poor. And I can usually spot the organizations that have legacy issues pretty quickly because I always, like if I go on their, their campus or their, you know, to their organizations, I, I get this question right out of the gate. So are you technical or non-technical? <laughs> Anybody work for an organization that that's kind of a thing? I see about half the hands, yeah. This is a, and as somebody who's coming from a non-technical background, this was hard. Like, there was a massive amount of self-reflection that I had to go through to feel like I could answer, yes, I am technical. And that's what, you know, you know to the point where I got inked up. 
And, but here's the thing, is that being technical or non-technical is not binary. And it's not mutually exclusive. You can be technical and non-technical. You can be technical and you can know how to communicate. You can come from a, any different background and you can learn how to code and how to, how to build software. And you know, as someone who is self-taught, I always felt like I had this thing called, they all called degree envy. <laughs> like, you know, that person has a CS degree and you know, it, that's why they're so good at coding. And you know, I don't, uh, if I could just find the time to spend four years of my life immersed in computer science, then I would be good at coding. But it doesn't work like that. Um, there's actually a great research project Mike Rosenbaum has done where he's let um, a resume system go for about 14 years. It's a kind of a big data mining project. And what comes out of that is that there is absolutely no correlation between having a college degree and being a good software engineer. So the people like me who are self-taught, we can be just as good of engineers as the people who have CS degrees. And I would say it goes the reverse. So I get asked a lot, like I get people say, well, you know, I feel like I have a CS background and so that means I'm really analytical. And you know, I would have to spend four years taking all these courses on marketing and sales and all, set, all the stuff that you did. And, um, and I don't know if I have time for that. And I would argue having 15 years of training technical people and scientists and all sorts, how to communicate that that's bunk, right? So, there is no correlation between your college degree or having a college degree and whether or not you are a good communicator. And so all of these skills can be self-taught. So here's a crash course. And it starts by asking the question, what is communication? And the very, very, very first thing that you have to understand about communication is that it is rooted in empathy. I'm going to pause for a little bit and just kind of let this slide soak in because it's one of the most important ones of the talk. So empathy is a noun. Empathy is a thing that you acquire after you have listened to someone and truly understood their point of view. So there's a lot of research, there's a lot of question asking, like there's a lot of reflection there, right? So that's, that's the first part. And then once you've acquired that, then you put on empathy almost like a lens. And you look at, you take the perspective of another person. And that other person could be the, your teammate, right? If you're having a conflict on, you know, how a style should be implemented or you know, your users in terms of how an error message might be written so that it actually makes sense to them, or it can even be your future self. So you know, what do I need six months from now to get context on what I was doing so that I can jump right back in? So empathy is incredibly important in communication. The next thing to think of are kind of events. All right, and we've got two different kinds. We've got synchronous and asynchronous. And synchronous events are, like right now, we are all meeting together, and this is a synchronous event. And I could say, let's all go hip, hip, hooray. Hooray! You're always supposed to join that. Hooray! <laughs> right? We all do it together, right? And the people who are um, watching this video later, they'll be doing it at a different time, right? So the time didn't happen. So that's the, that's the difference between synchronous and asynchronous events. There's also obvious and not obvious. So on the obvious ones, we've got things like meetings and phone calls and video calls, you know, documentation, email, uh, Slack, Twitter, forum messages, things like that. But some kind of not obvious uh, synchronous events are things like do you use eye contact, right? What's your handshake feel like? What is your body language? Are you feeling like confident or are you slunched over and feeling not confident? You know, do you show up for meetings on time? You know, are you able to articulate what your company does in you know, a couple of sentences or less? 
So these are all kind of like the not obvious ones. We don't immediately think of them, but they're still important. And then we have the asynchronous ones, which is we use a lot of asynchronous um, forms of communication when we develop software, and I'll go through just a few. So first is commit messages, right? Um, and I always think that commit messages are really some of the best forms of documentation because they're tied to git blame, and so you can always get rationale for why a change was made if you actually fill out the description part of your commit messages. Um, how many of y'all have ever run git blame and then it ends up being yourself, right? <laughs> so, um, so this is like, oh, it's a good reminder to, you know, to remember kind of what headspace you were in at the time. And it's tightly coupled with the software itself. So, um, so this is always good. Um, next is naming, right? So are we naming our variables and our methods and our classes in a way that is intention revealing? Or are we just choosing things like foo and bar and then we'll clean them up later? And um, you know, there, there is a great article um, by Arlo Belshi called Naming is a Process. And it talks about how you do kind of go through refactoring your names. Um, but at the same time, it's like if you know something right out of the gate, you know, naming something foo and bar may not be the best choice. So, of course, if you're using test-driven development, behavior-driven development, you've got scenarios, tests, love these. All of these are awesome. And pull requests. So, um, one of our new developers uh, recently put an animated GIF in um, a pull request comment, and it was like, mind blown, right? So it was very intention revealing and it was very clear what change he was making. He was uh, um, changing the width of uh, um, the header bar dynamically when somebody uh, scrolled down the page. So it, it was nice. And that GIF, um, you know, just a real quick video showed way more than if he had typed everything out. All right, timesheets. I know that some of y'all's eyes rolled. I saw them, right? <laughs> um, so timesheets are actually incredibly important. And uh, think about your customer, right? So if you, if you listen to your customer, you understand your customer, and then you apply perspective taking to your customer, um, especially if you're in the consulting realm, timesheets become very important because it helps them be able to budget faster, right? It helps them be able to understand what you've done on a project. So thinking about timesheets in a different way as a way to serve your customers can become incredibly empowering. And then error messages, yay. Um, <laughs> we, we saw some of that in John Paul's talk earlier. But the, you know, the error messages is like, you know, whenever I come across a completely useless error message, I get really, really frustrated. And so taking the time to have empathy for your user about what their frame of reference is going to be when they encounter that error message is a huge form of communication. So lots of different things. And I think the way that I define communication is that it's simply an artifact of your ideas. So you have an idea and then you create something that kind of is almost to be used like a trail of breadcrumbs that you can go back and go, oh yeah, that's what I was thinking at that moment in time. So these are the artifacts that you know, kind of help us understand the context. And if we think about that in kind of the artifacts way, it's not that different than code, right? Because code is just an artifact of, an art, of our ideas, right? It's the way that we're expressing how we would intend a computer to execute a program. So, not that different. So switching gears just a teensy bit, I'm gonna talk about legacy code. And so at Corgibytes, we do a lot of upgrading frameworks, um, adding tests to places that have no test coverage, um, and in just in general, kind of paying down tech debt. And we freaking love it, it's awesome. Um, there are so many interesting engineering problems in legacy code. And what makes people hate legacy code is not the code. The reason that people hate legacy code is because the communication around the project 
is so poor. You can't work on a legacy project unless you have really good communication. And we know this because of Conway's law. So the way that we define legacy code, you know, I'm gonna suggest something. So the, the typical way we define it now is by Michael Feathers, and he wrote a book called Coding, Working Effectively with Legacy Code about 10 years ago, and it's kind of the Bible of legacy code work. And there's so much great stuff in there, including a definition that he says legacy code is code without tests. And he's since gone on to say, well, that's the way I view it. I didn't mean for like the entire world to adopt it because quickly it becomes very, very, very polarizing, right? 100% test coverage is kind of approaching an asymptote and is really unrealistic on a project anyway. Also, it, you may have projects where it just it doesn't make a lot of sense. If you're just doing a quick prototype or you, know, you are using something that you know there's not gonna be any users, you know, why would you have the test there if you know you're just gonna throw it away? So you have to think about the context in which the tests are, are operating. And so the way that I started thinking about it is that I think legacy code is code without communication artifacts, of which tests are a really important one. So think of it kind of like an archeologist, right? So if you're on an archeological dig and you're trying to understand how a civilization you know, worked, something like bones would give you a lot of information, right? Like you'd be able to understand what they ate and like whether or not they were farmers based on like their joints and how tall they were. Like there's a lot of information that you can glean from that. And so that's kind of how I think of tests. Like tests are a really, really important part of understanding the context of the system that you're working in. But they're not the only one, right? So in the archeological metaphor, you've got things like foundations of buildings, you've got writing, you've got coins, you've got, you know, insert artifact here. And so when we look at that in context of software, you know, we have all of the different types of communication that I just described. And so it's looking at all of those different artifacts together that makes something, you know, easy to work with. And if you don't have hardly any of them, right, so if you don't have good, clean, intention-revealing code, and then it, you also don't have tests, and then you also don't have um, documentation, and then you also can't create a meeting with somebody who worked on the project, right, it's gonna be really, really challenging to go in and figure out what the heck that system is doing. So why does this stuff matter? Three reasons. So the first is that Working on your communication is the best way to level up your career. Because if you want to move from being a junior developer to a lead developer, that means you're gonna start working with clients more. So you're gonna have to communicate more. Right? If you want to become a CTO, that means you're gonna be talking about strategic initiatives and not just technical initiatives. So again, you're gonna to have to broaden your scope and learn more about communication. If you wanna run your own business, um, there's a whole bunch of communication there. Now you're talking about marketing to users and learning more about different people. So code is going to be a very big part of your job. And if you want people to contribute to your open source project, if you want them to feel welcomed, right, then, that, it, then again, communication becomes incredibly important. I look at well-maintained open source projects, like one of my favorite is Free Code Camp. And I mean, Quincy just does such an amazing job there of maintaining his pull requests and keeping them up to date and using tags and labels appropriately. And he sends timely emails with interesting things. And he's got you know, a blog on Medium where he's constantly sharing different ideas. And that is what has rallied people to his community and it has caused Free Code Camp to just be a really, really valuable and well-maintained project. So the next reason this is important is because communication builds trust. And we know that having a team where trust is um, a part of it, where people feel like they have psychological safety, um, then good ideas come to life. They get flourished. So, 
this is a marble jar, and the reason I use this is because in her book, Daring Greatly, Dr. Brene Brown, who is a researcher from the University of Houston, she researches shame and vulnerability and empathy. And she uses the analogy of a marble jar as a, as a metaphor for building trust, because basically she, at the time, when she wrote her book, her daughter was in fourth or fifth grade, and the teacher had, every time the students, the class collectively did well, the teacher would drop something in the marble jar. And if they got it up to a certain level, then they all got a pizza party. And that's a good way to describe trust, right? Trust is built by adding a series of small interactions to your marble jar, right? Like all of us have marble jars for everyone, right? Like if there are people here who don't know each other, you don't have a lot of marbles in your jar. But as you get to know people and as you get to trust them, right? Like I think about in Jen's talk, like that, um, the number 12, helping the other number 12 grow up. Like that is, that is a small act, but it creates trust. It's dropping something in the marble jar. So it, it's doing small things every single day that builds up trust. And all of those small things tend to be communication. So the last is that it prevents fires. So um, I don't know about y'all, but I don't like fighting fires. I much prefer <laughs> a prevention strategy. I don't like running around with kind of this feeling like that I'm all stressed out all the time. So one of the core values that we have at Corgi Bites is calm the chaos. And we believe that the best solutions to problems don't happen when you're all stressed out and high on adrenaline. They actually happen when you are calm and you are using your prefrontal cortex. And this can only happen when your culture is soaked in really good communication. And the good news is, is that very similar to software, we have patterns and frameworks that we can look to to help us up our game. And let's first mention that in his book, um, Refactoring to Patterns, Joshua Kirievsky talks about how you don't, it's not like a light switch where you just say, I'm going to implement this framework, and then all of a sudden start using it. It's more like a dimmer where, you know, you slowly move to a new framework over time. So these are just things to start looking at and behavioral things that you can kind of start changing today, right as you walk out of this auditorium, um, and that eventually you can move to the new framework from wherever you are right now. So we're going to go over three really quickly. So the first is context switching, all right? Struggle is real, right? There is a, there is a real cost to this, and let me tell you, marketers have no idea. They truly, truly do not understand. And I can say that as somebody who is a marketer. Um, this was kind of, when Scott and I were early in our, in our relationship in building the company, we, Scott would be kind of coding and he wouldn't have his headphones on. So I'm like, okay, he's interruptible. And he would just be doing his thing. And I would walk up to him and be like, hey, Scott, you got a sec? And then this was usually his reaction. And I was so confused because I, I didn't understand why he got so upset. Because I was like genuinely trying to be, he could have said no, right? And so it was through a lot of empathy. Um, and uh, I sometimes forget to mention this in these talks. Scott and I also became married after being business partners for a little while. So also through a lot of couples counseling that we, that we like really dug into this issue. And we came up with the metaphor of the, from the movie Inception one day because Scott, when I did this, he was like, I'm so frustrated because I was like seven layers down. In, I was seven Inception layers down. And immediately I understood what he was talking about. Because there's this, if you haven't seen the movie, it's like you have this dream within a dream within a dream and kind of these abstracted models. Hi, Randy. <laughs> that 
that's an example of getting pulled out of an inception layer, right? So, <laughs> it can be frustrating. Um, so, so the idea is that you have a dream within a dream within a dream within a dream. And if something interrupts you, you get almost the mental equivalent of the bends. And then it takes you a long time to kind of figure out where you were, right? Like, oh my gosh, okay, what was I talking about? Was I on this slide or that slide? So um, what we decided to do was we implemented um, inception layers as a way to communicate with folks at Corgi Bytes. And so now, instead of saying, you got a sec, we say inception layer. And the way this works is if somebody is at a, you know, below a two, because it goes, you can go just as technical, but then also like strategic. Like when I'm working on a strategic plan, I'm not looking very down deep in the weeds. I'm instead looking up in the sky in the 10,000 foot view. And um, the, the way this works is if somebody doesn't respond, that means they're interruptible, right? So, it, so responding is optional, right? But the reason that this works is because the only thing you have to hold in your head is a number. And so you can keep that and say, hey, what's your inception layer? Like you can look over real quick and go five. And you haven't lost your mental model. But when I ask the question, hey, you got a sec, you're holding that mental model. And then you go, okay, I know Andrea doesn't mean a sec. Okay, do you think this is a five minute or a 20 minute conversation? Okay, I've got, I said that I was gonna get to this client. Oh, shit, 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 ah! And then you see your mental model just completely crumble and slip away just like it happens in the movie Inception. So this has been a really great way for us on our team to, to just learn how to communicate with each other. So the next I call the shattering glass pattern. Um, and I got this from How I Met Your Mother because there's an episode on there where Ted um, and kind of everybody, they notice the bad habits that they have. And every time they have a bad habit, like a mirror breaks over their head and they start to notice just how often they do this. And Ted's bad habit was, well, actually. And I can tell you that engineers saying, well, actually, to somebody who is new to coding is just as annoying as when we come up to you and say, hey, got a sec. So there might be a little bit of empathy there, right? Um, I would be trying to describe a concept and Scott would interrupt and say, well, actually, you're talking about this, right? And usually it was something kind of like what Jen was saying, like, you're not talking about parameter, you're talking about, you know, and I'm like, uh. And um, the, the way to kind of build consensus, because this approach is incredibly divisive, right? And so the way to kind of move to the, the other side is to be less like Ted and more like Tina. And to say yes and. And this is an improv approach that she outlines masterfully in her book Bossy Pants. And the idea is that you acknowledge where somebody is coming from. So you say yes, I understand you, I hear you. And, and then you build on it. So here's an example. Let's say that a client comes to you or the business comes to you with a scope change. That never happens, right? And when I say, well, actually, that's not going to fit in our current release cycle, so you're going to have to figure out something else, right? Like, that makes me sound like a jerk. <laughs> but, and it's, it, like, it leaves the other person feeling that they're not heard, that you don't want to work with them. Um, and that could be the case, but you know, you're not going to ever improve a relationship by using that style. The, oh, another way to say that using the, the, the yes and framework would be to say, yes, I understand that this is really important to you. And we're in the middle of a sprint right now. So let's find a time for us to get together so that we can learn about what each other's needs and goals actually are, and I'm sure that we can find something that will work for both of us, right? That's like, okay, that person is reasonable, right? You're still setting boundaries, you're still being clear, you know, but at the same time, you're working towards consensus using empathy. So the last one is how not to sound like a jerk. And this is a fantastic, um, I just love this framework so much. It's uh, been developed by Kim Scott, who used to run the AdWord um, team over at Google. And 
on the top axis, the vertical axis, she calls that the give a damn axis. So you indicate that you care personally. And then the um, challenge directly axis is how much am I willing to piss you off axis. And she gives this great story about her dog, Belvedere, and how she was walking her dog, and she loved, loved, loved this dog. And he was getting ready to run out into traffic. He was a puppy, and she had him on a leash, and just, he, he was hard to control. And a stranger came up to her on the street and said, I can tell that you really, really love that dog. She goes, yeah, I do. And then he goes, and if you don't get that dog trained, you're going to kill him. That's the challenge directly. So, so some people think that the care personally has to be developed over this long time. And that's, that's useful, right, that trust jar metaphor. But at the same time, you can do it in an instant. You know, Kim didn't know that person who confronted her, but it really made her think, right? And he did it in a way that was very masterful and didn't make her feel bad for not training her dog, but it did challenge her behavior and made her um, actually go get her dog trained. So there's a, a few things, um, you know, about radical candor. Um, so keeping in mind that the feedback that you get should be based in humility, it should be helpful, immediate. You criticize people privately, you praise people publicly, and you don't personalize. And sometimes I wish that sites like Hacker News would really learn about this type of framework. <laughs> um, because you know, when you give feedback in this way, people feel like they want to be part of a community. They want to help. Right? And this is how you build consensus rather than pushing people away. So if you get nothing out of this talk, I want you to remember this. That coding is a skill and you can learn it. And I believe in you. I don't care what your background is. I don't care if you have a college degree. You can learn to be a really good communicator. You can learn to teach the other people on your team to be really good communicators too. And if those of us who have more of a communication background work with the people who have more of a coding background and people with more of a technical background work with the people who you know, have more of a communication background, we can build some amazing stuff together. So there are some books. I actually have several of these. So if you want a copy, come see me during the party. I've got like four copies of some books um, that I'd be happy to give away to people who want them. And you know, dive in, get curious, start learning about communication just like you learned how to code with that same kind of passion. Add English to your tech stack and we will all make software just a little bit better. Thank you.